Section 1. You will hear a conversation between a man and a woman discussing a mobile phone contract. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You will see that there is an example. This time only the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello, welcome to RNN Mobile. My name's Tom. How can I help you? Hello, I'd like to discuss my new mobile contract. Would you mind giving me your customer ID? Just a moment, please. Here it is. TR349573. So, TR349573 is the correct answer. Now the full test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as the recording is not played twice. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello, welcome to RNN Mobile. My name's Tom. How can I help you? Hello, I'd like to discuss my new mobile contract. Would you mind giving me your customer ID? Just a moment, please. Here it is. TR349573. Thank you. Now, just for confirmation, could you provide me with your date of birth? Sure. It's the 12th of March, 1982. And what's the zip code of your current address? It's 85823. What's the number of your house at that location? 30. And finally, your name, please. Jennifer Wright. Would you spell that, please? Jennifer is J E N I F E R. Wright is W R I G H T. That's interesting. We had you before as Jennifer, with only one N. I'll just change that. Now, I notice here that we don't have a home number for you. That can be very useful for us in case you have a problem on your mobile and we can't phone you on it. My home number is 019349813423. Finally, can you just confirm for me how you pay your monthly bill? I do that with direct debit. Okay, Miss Wright. Thank you. That has confirmed your identity. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. Last Wednesday, I ordered a new contract, but I only saw yesterday that the terms have changed. Absolutely right. Now I wanted to know whether I am also eligible to have an additional 2 gigabytes of internet each month. Just a moment, please. Okay, I just looked into this, and I'm sorry to say that you're not eligible. Could you do anything about it? As a matter of fact, you're in luck. As you did not yet activate the SIM card, we will be able to send you a new contract along with a new SIM card. That would be great. Are there any extra costs? No, there will be no extra costs for you. Furthermore, you will also be able to use our TFR network, which is one of the fastest available. That sounds great. And how about the terms and conditions? Will I be able to terminate the contract? Absolutely. You'll be able to terminate the contract, but you must, however, terminate 30 days in advance. Sounds great. And the price of $45 per month will stay the same? Exactly. May I proceed to delete your current contract and start the new one? Absolutely. Could I also order a new mobile telephone? Yes, you will be able to do that on our website. I'll send you an email with the link to our online store. I have now also changed your contract. You'll be able to reauthorize your payment, so you'll just need to sign here, please. That's it. Can I help you in any other way? No, that's all. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Have a great day. That is the end of section one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. 
Section 2. You will hear a man giving some people information about a holiday park. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the information talk and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning everyone, I'm Mr Jenkins. I'd like to welcome you all today to our holiday park. Now you've all just spent the first night in your rooms and I hope you had a restful night. What I'd like to do is to tell you a little bit about the holiday park and what we have on offer for you. As you may be aware, right now we're at the Central Coffee Bar in the holiday park's main building, which is known as the Johnson Building. This is a large building in the very centre of the park. The coffee bar here is open every day from 6am until 8pm. It serves coffees, teas and other infusions, along with a variety of cold drinks and hot and cold snacks. It does not serve proper meals. For that, you'll need to go to one of our other restaurants, such as our pizzeria, French Bistro or Asian Street Cafe elsewhere in the park. More of that later. Also available in this building is the main reception. If you have any questions about the park, just go there and speak to our receptionists. One exception to this is anything to do with money. If you need to pay any bills or inquire about any costs, you'll need to go to the finance office, which is in a separate building 200 metres down the drive towards the main entrance. The maintenance team are also based there, so go there if there's anything wrong in your rooms or if you see anything faulty in the park. Back to where we are now. On the second floor, you'll find the first aid centre, which has a lovely view of the lake, and our cinema, which can be seen at the far end of the lake. There, we show old and new movies that hopefully appeal to all ages and tastes. The first aid centre has a nurse on duty 24 hours a day. The nurse can also get you to the doctor's surgery around half an hour away if there's anything she can't deal with. The rest of the second floor is taken up with various administration offices. On the floor above that is our fitness area, which you can use at any time if you are over 18 years of age. The fitness area does not include our saunas, steam rooms and treatment areas, which are found next to the main swimming pool. In the fitness area, you can work out on your own or book a session with one of our instructors. If you're feeling lazy, just go to our internet cafe, which is next to the fitness area. You can comfortably surf the net with a hot chocolate while watching the more motivated people work out. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the information talk and answer questions 16 to 20. We have plenty of activities for you and your family to enjoy. I will describe some of these now. In the south of the park is our water park complex. It's a £10 entrance fee for the public but free for residents. Also this area is open to the public in the afternoons but in the mornings it's reserved for the residents of the holiday park and that's you. The water park opens from 9 in the morning and closes at 6 in the late afternoon. The resident only time changes at midday. We also have a mini golf, which is open from 9am to 6pm. You don't need to own any equipment, just turn up and we'll supply everything. The mini golf can be quite busy, so we limit the number of people on the area at any one time. Groups of maximum 5 people are allowed to start playing at 5 minute intervals. Reservations are not permitted, so it's run on a first-come, first-play basis. There is no cost for the mini-golf. For the keep fit amongst you, we run a jogging club, which meets twice a day. The first session is at 8am and covers a distance of around 4 kilometres. The jog goes through the forest on easy, flat trails. The second session is at 5pm and is longer, at 6 kilometres. This also goes through the forest on well-tended trails, but is hillier and more demanding. Both the jogs are led by two of our fitness instructors. One will lead the jog and the other will bring up the rear. The sessions start with some warming up exercises and end with stretching. Not far away is the historic town of Levington. With its medieval castle and the historic old town with the old four to five walls still standing, this is a popular visiting place for our guests. We have a minibus service that goes to Levington every day at 1pm. 
and returns at 5pm. There's an extra cost of £2 return for this service. Tickets can be bought at the main reception area. You can also buy tickets from the bus driver, but if all the tickets are sold, you may find yourself disappointed, so book ahead if you really want to go. That is the end of section 2. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a student giving his presentation and interacting with his university teacher. First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good morning, Professor Norris. We're all here now. Thanks, Alex. Good morning, everyone. Today we're going to hear from Alex, who is going to do his presentation. First of all, I'd like to tell you that next week's seminar on your next essay is not in this room, but in room 425 in the History Department. It's the room that has all the pictures of the Great Wall of China in it. We're doing a swap with the History Department for just that day so that they can use this larger room which will suit their purposes. Now, Alex, are you ready? Yes, thank you, Professor Norris. I'm ready. So what do you plan to talk about today? Well, many of you will have heard of the Forest of Dean. Let everyone know where it is, just in case. It's on the borders of South Wales and England, near the River Severn which is the longest river in the UK. Thank you. Now, what are you going to tell us about the Forest of Dean? I'd like to focus today on the new colonies of wild boar that have sprung up in the forest. These are wild pigs, if you didn't know. This fits in with our core subject, which explores how new non-indigenous species can affect a natural environment. Surely wild boars are native to the UK, though? They were, but they went extinct here around 700 years ago. I know it's not quite the same, but 700 years is a long time and the forest environment adapted to the boar's absence. It's pretty much the same as if a foreign species were introduced. Yes, I think I agree with that. So, boars were once common in the forest of Dean and were hunted for food. In medieval times, boars from the royal forest were supplied for the king's table. There is a record of an order for a hundred boars and sows for a Christmas feast in 1254. Boars are thought to have become extinct in Britain due to overhunting not long after this time, although disease also was a more minor factor. The farming of wild boars in Britain became fashionable in the 1970s, but the principal issue facing the industry was that it was not particularly profitable. In 1999, boars escaped or were released from a farm near the Forest of Dean. In 2004, a group of about 60 farm-raised boars were dumped near the forest. Really? So many boar escaped from one farm? No. In the second case, the boar were released. A farm was going out of business and it was easier for them to just release the boar rather than go through the selling process. Were they prosecuted? I'm afraid I don't know. I just focused on the boars. That's okay. It's not important. Anyway, very soon it was clear that the two released populations had merged and, in spite of worries by the Forestry Commission regarding limited bloodlines, a healthy breeding population was surviving in the forest. The breeding has caused the population to grow steadily, and there is now believed to be an excess of 800 boars in the forest of Dean, with the population expanding out into neighbouring areas. Boar are now feral throughout the forest area, and the forest of Dean population is the largest of the breeding populations that now exist in England. You now have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen to the rest of the presentation and answer questions 26 to 30. The problem with the released and breeding wild boars in the Forest of Dean is that the population is getting too large. Who is actually responsible for controlling the population? That's an interesting legal point. Once the animals escaped, the government's position is that free-roaming wild boars are feral wild animals and as such do not belong to anyone and that responsibility for managing wild boars rests with the landowner. Thus, feral wild boars have the status of a wild animal, such as wild deer and foxes. What will happen to the excess numbers, then? Well, many people feel that the numbers are not a problem. Although there are stories of wild boars being dangerous, locals next to the Forest of Dean say this is not the case. When wild boars are disturbed by walkers, the tendency is for one of the larger sows to position themselves between the walkers and the young, often accompanied by much snorting, whilst the family group leads the young to safety. Once the family has moved off, the defending sow will usually suddenly turn and run off to rejoin the group. The defending sow may well also be provoked into a mock charge at the intruding people, particularly if that group continue to approach for a better look, or simply because they have not noticed the boars. Male boars can be more aggressive, but so far there are only stories of dogs being chased. I don't expect that the government have accepted the stories of locals. Absolutely not. There are now regular culls of the wild boar population by the Forestry Commission in the Forest of Dean. Forest rangers on specific days go out and destroy carefully selected numbers of the animals. The problem is that animal rights activists object to the culls and try to disrupt them. Can't the forest just be closed on cull days? No. The forest is open land. The activists know that the forest rangers conducting the cull have to stay close to big paths so that they can bring vehicles to move the dead carcasses of the animals away. The activists just divide the forest up and watch over the big paths and make lots of noise and move bait. Are the activists successful? To a certain extent, yes. It's a big forest and they can't be everywhere, but they create enough disruption that they have spoiled quite a few of the planned cull days. The forest rangers are quite annoyed about this and point out that the large numbers of wild boar can affect the lives of other inhabitants of the forest. The forest rangers haven't given up though, and they now keep the cull dates secret and try and catch the activists unprepared. That is the end of section 3. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear part of an environmental science lecture on bottom trawling fishing in New Zealand. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. Today in this environmental sciences lecture, we're going to look at bottom trawling and we will focus this time on our own waters here in New Zealand. The area of ocean and seabed out to 200 nautical miles from New Zealand's coastline is called the Exclusive Economic Zone or EEZ. This area covers approximately 3.9 million square kilometres and is the fifth largest EEZ in the world. The depth of the sea within this area can extend to 10,000 metres. 
The marine landscapes within New Zealand's EEZ include spectacular underwater mountains, valleys, geysers and muddy flats. These are home to coral, sponges and other unique forms of marine life. Fishing can damage the seabed and the corals, sponges and other life found there, particularly when bottom trawl or dredge fishing gear is used. How much damage occurs depends on a number of factors including the type of seabed habitat that is being fished and the particular equipment being used. Conservation groups say bottom trawling is the most destructive type of fishing undertaken in the world's oceans today. Bottom trawling involves dragging huge heavy nets along the sea floor. Large metal plates and rubber wheels attached to these nets move along the bottom and crush nearly everything in their path. The bottom trawling net indiscriminately catches every life and object it encounters. Thus many creatures end up mistakenly caught and thrown overboard dead or dying, including endangered fish and even vulnerable deep sea corals, which can live for several hundred years. This collateral damage which is known as the bycatch, can amount to 90% of a trawl's total catch. Conservationists claim that all evidence indicates that deep water life forms are very slow to recover from such damage, taking decades to hundreds of years if they recover at all. Commercial fishing companies, not surprisingly, tell a different story. All human activity has some degree of impact on the natural environment. What is important is that these activities are closely monitored to ensure that impacts are managed and kept to an acceptable level. The New Zealand Ministry of Fisheries says it closely monitors bottom trawling as part of a comprehensive fisheries management regime. In New Zealand, one of the ways this is achieved on land is by setting aside large areas as national parks where activities such as intensive farming are not permitted. In the marine environment, the approach is no different. In 2007, the New Zealand government, with the support of the fishing industry, closed 1.1 million square kilometres of seabed to bottom trawling and dredging, which is close to a third of New Zealand's entire EEZ. The 17 separate closed areas, known as benthic protection areas or BPAs, mainly cover areas of New Zealand waters that have never been trawled. The seabed within these areas is largely in an untouched state and includes the full range of deep sea underwater landscapes that occur across the EEZ. In addition to the BPAs, 18 areas around underwater seamounts and geysers have been closed to all types of trawling because of the unique marine life that is found there. Across New Zealand's EEZ, half of all known seamounts and all known active hydrothermal vents are closed to all trawling. In addition to the BPAs, the New Zealand Ministry of Fisheries says most of the New Zealand EEZ is deeper than 1,250 metres and there is very little bottom trawling below that depth in New Zealand. Scientists have recently calculated that in excess of 91% of the New Zealand EEZ has never been bottom trawled. Finally, the New Zealand Ministry of Fisheries says it also regularly monitors where fishing vessels have operated and the type and quantity of marine species, such as corals and sponges, which are caught. New Zealand claims it is a world leader in successfully managing the effects that bottom trawling has on the seabed, closing one of the largest areas of marine space to bottom trawling in the world. Conservation groups are not happy with the New Zealand government though. They say that the ban doesn't extend to all vulnerable ecosystems and that some of the areas covered have already been fished out or are too deep to bottom trawl anyway. Of course, one third protection that the New Zealand government is so proud of leaves the two thirds unprotected and even if one third of a particular environment is protected, the damage inflicted in the other two thirds does have an impact on the rest. Conservation groups say the only real way to protect the seabeds is to ban bottom trawling altogether and that if this means that consumers have to pay more for their fish then this is a reasonable price to pay to preserve the underwater environment surrounding New Zealand. A final less noticed effect 
but extremely important nonetheless, is that small community economies are affected, as their fishermen's catch sizes are strongly affected by the enormous takes of industrial trawlers. That is the end of section 4. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of listening test 3. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.